I'm going to begin today with a bit of trivia. Who is this guy here on the screen? Some of you will know, but a lot of you won't, and you're not stupid for not knowing. This is Ben Ali, the former president of Tunisia who was overthrown by his people in 2011. And with Ben Ali overthrown, the populace of a lot of neighboring Arab countries saw their opportunity to oust their leader too. Egypt and Yemen gave their leaders the Ben Ali treatment, and then major protests broke out from Morocco to Sudan and all the way to Jordan. And I begin with this, the Arab Spring, because this is the context in which our two men of the hour, Colonel Gaddafi and Barack Obama, found themselves in. In the midst of the Arab Spring in early 2011, Libyan leader Colonel Gaddafi faced the exact same issue as his neighbors. In eastern Benghazi, rebels arose to threaten his 40-year rule, and in March, Obama gave a press conference to explain that America would be intervening to oppose Gaddafi. But this was bizarre. Much of Obama's 2008 election campaign was on Bush's needless intervention in Iraq, so why now did he seem so quick to go after Libya? In today's episode of Enemies of the West, we're not going to be looking at the entirety of Gaddafi's 40 years as Libyan leader, but instead we're going to break down why he was an enemy of the West at the end of his tenure, and to ultimately scratch beneath the surface as to why Obama wanted him out. Let's get into it. Hello there. So basically in this half hour address, which I'll link in the description below, Obama gave his rationale for why Libya needed intervention. And I strongly encourage you to watch the whole thing to check that I'm not cherry picking, but basically Obama's rationale was that Libya was under tyranny and as the global leader of freedom, America had a responsibility to liberate Libya from tyranny. Here's just a small collection of his references to tyranny. For more than four decades, the Libyan people have been ruled by a tyrant. Muammar Gaddafi. He has denied his people freedom, exploited their wealth. Moreover, even after Gaddafi does leave power, 40 years of tyranny has left Libya fractured. Now, no question, Gaddafi was an autocrat who had power completely concentrated into his hands, but labeling Gaddafi as a tyrant which has connotations of cruelty and oppression is a pretty selective way of looking at it. Gaddafi came to power in a coup in 1969 and he branded himself as a socialist who would redistribute Libya's oil wealth into the hands of the people. And to be honest, Gaddafi's social programs had a huge impact on the quality of life for Libyans. The literacy rate went from 12% to 90% and when compared to its surrounding North African countries like Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt and Morocco, each country started at a higher percentage but still none reached 90% like Libya in 2011. Child mortality fell to 1.5% when the African average was 12.5%. There was free education and healthcare, not to mention that Libyans enjoyed the highest living standards of all of Africa. Now, did Gaddafi use deadly force to protect his position of power? Absolutely. But to insinuate that Gaddafi's regime was pure tyranny and that he wanted to oppress its own people is just hard to argue. Secondly, Obama made the argument that Gaddafi was a violent ruler and as the leaders of the free world, they couldn't just turn a blind eye. To brush aside America's responsibility as a leader, and more profoundly, our responsibilities to our fellow human beings under such circumstances would have been a betrayal of who we are. Some nations may be able to turn a blind eye to atrocities in other countries. The United States of America is different, as repressive leaders concluded that violence is the best strategy to cling to power. Now, I can appreciate that Obama was not one of these presidents, but here Obama was speaking as the leader of the USA and not as Barack from Chicago. And historically, the USA did not just turn a blind eye to Gaddafi's brutality, but actually used it for their own selfish purposes. During the war on terror, Gaddafi invited the International Atomic Energy Authority to inspect and dismantle their nukes and mustard gas. Afterwards, as part of the extraordinary rendition program, the CIA sent suspected terrorists to Gaddafi to be tortured. Prior to 2011, one of the main opponents of Gaddafi's were Islamic extremists, and so the CIA basically used Gaddafi's internal political struggle to do their dirty work for them. Gaddafi was even hugged by Tony Blair as late as 2009. If we go back even earlier to the 1980s, we saw the USA actually used violence against Libyan citizens. Basically, long story short, some Americans were killed in a nightclub bombing in Berlin, and the attack was linked to the Libyan embassy. Reagan retaliated by bombing Benghazi and Tripoli, killing 100 citizens. In 2001, the German court found that though the bombing seemed to come from Libyan intelligence, they could not at all be traced to Gaddafi himself, and they also found that the USA was very unwilling to share evidence in the trial. As repressive leaders concluded that violence is the best strategy to cling to power. Ironic. Now, I'm halfway through the video and I still haven't actually addressed the specifics behind the Libyan people's initial uprising against Gaddafi. Basically, in the midst of the Arab Spring, Libyans protested against the authoritarian nature of Gaddafi, and when the Gaddafi regime attacked protesters, a civil war began to emerge. Obama made a pretty persuasive case as to why they sided with the rebels. Libyans took to the streets to claim their basic human rights. Gaddafi chose to escalate his attacks, launching a military campaign against the Libyan people. The only issue with this is that the account of what actually happened during those initial protests is very contested, 
and Obama's portrayal of events is not the only narrative. For example, the Belfast Center, which is a Harvard think tank, has made the argument that in all four of the cities that saw a major conflict in February 2011, each conflict was actually initiated by violent protesters. Obama also said this. In the past, we had seen him hang civilians in the streets and kill over a thousand people in a single day. And honestly, I've researched all over double checking that Obama wasn't referring to something else and couldn't find anything. So I'll cautiously assume that Obama was referring to the early days of the protests where some Western media outlets were reporting over 2,000 deaths in a day. If this is what Obama was referring to though, again, that just wasn't true. The Human Rights Watch report, which came later, accounted for a death toll of 233 across all of Libya during that period. Not to mention that the report also found that protesters had beaten soldiers to death, hanged at least three soldiers, and that soldiers were being shot dead after surrender or capture. Now, obviously, there was plenty of legitimacy to the Libyan protesters, and the Libyan military was certainly extreme in their suppression. But Obama's framework of tyranny versus liberty is, in my opinion, a much less helpful framework than two power bases competing against each other. In his address, Obama also briefly alluded to a third way forward where Gaddafi was to be pressured into giving concessions to the people. Tomorrow, Secretary Clinton will go to London, where she will meet with the Libyan opposition and consult with more than 30 nations. These discussions will focus on what kind of political effort is necessary to pressure Gaddafi, while also supporting a transition to the future that the Libyan people deserve. Now, I like to be critical without being a cynic, and I like to try and avoid attributing sinister motives to people unless there's a smoking gun. But in this case, there was just no way what Obama said could have been true. And given that he also said this, Of course, there is no question that Libya and the world would be better off with Gaddafi out of power. I see no other explanation for America's intervention into the Libyan civil war apart from wanting regime change. By March, the International Crisis Group had already put forward a plan for settlement with a resolution for Gaddafi to end all civilian attacks and have a ceasefire. According to its spokesman Hugh Roberts, Gaddafi met the demands within a few hours. Yes. However, this was immediately rejected by key general Khalifa Haftar, whose Wikipedia bio says this about him, on the grounds that Gaddafi couldn't be trusted and this was just immediately accepted as gospel by the West. Not to mention that Turkey attempted to hold peaceful talks to which Gaddafi agreed, but the National Transitional Council, the Western-backed rebels, rejected it. Gaddafi then proposed three more ceasefires across April, May and June, but all were rejected. So when Obama said this, These discussions will focus on what kind of political effort is necessary to pressure Gaddafi. Pressure Gaddafi to do what? He seemed pretty willing to meet all the demands, and let's face it, he knew he'd never beat NATO-backed forces, so meeting the demands was his only option. Finally, I want to focus on what Obama had to say regarding Gaddafi's enemies who would be led to power. As was standard for early 21st century America, Obama threw in a few Al-Qaeda references to legitimize what they were doing. Meanwhile, as we speak, our troops are supporting our ally Japan, leaving Iraq to its people, stopping the Taliban's momentum in Afghanistan, and going after Al-Qaeda all across the globe. However, getting rid of Gaddafi was almost certainly a move that was better for Al-Qaeda. Gaddafi had vehemently hunted down suspected Al-Qaeda affiliates during the War on Terror, not to mention that Abdul Hakim Belhaji, who was the resistance military commander of Tripoli, was also the former leader of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group who provided hundreds of recruits to Al-Qaeda. As with every episode of Enemies of the West, the point of this video isn't to say that Gaddafi was good. He could be a ruthless dictator and I'm still grateful I spent the noughties in Australia rather than Libya. But when we scratch beneath the surface, we really can see that there's so much more going on here than simply liberty versus tyranny. As to why Obama may have wanted regime change, I don't know. To be honest, I'm not convinced it was entirely his decision. The easy answer is access to oil reserves, but my hunch is that it's a little bit more sophisticated than just that. I guess that's one of the limits of studying history that's just a decade old. Thanks for watching. If you like the response style of video, make sure to hit the like button and comment with your thoughts below. How should the Obama administration be remembered? We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.